Please be turning your Bibles to the New Testament and specifically 1 Peter 3. We'll be reading there starting in verse 18 in just a moment. We certainly welcome all here this morning. To those on the internet, we're thankful you've come our way. We trust that if you have any questions in this audience or in the wider internet audience, we'd be glad to address them, uh, those questions of a Bible, religious, moral nature. And we urge anybody who's hearing us to do their best to find the faithful congregation of God's people and to be a part of that congregation. Now going to 1 Peter 3, and we'll start reading in verse 18. Remembering that, of course, Peter is writing to Christians. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, that is, made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Before we make comment regarding that passage and other things that are introduced to us elsewhere in the Bible. Let us emphasize that what I am addressing this morning and answering is the question, how was Noah saved? How was Noah saved? We need to recognize that when it comes to the matter of baptism, most people who call on Jesus Christ to save them do not consider baptism to have anything in the world to do with salvation. They think the moment they mentally assent to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that they are from that point forward saved by Christ. Now there are people, all sorts of religious people who believe in Christ as Savior, who engage in baptism. But they do not do it in order to be saved from their alien sins. Many of them, such as the Calvinists, don't even believe in such a thing as alien sins. These are sins, transgression of God's law, that alienates us or separates us from God. They, if they follow Calvinistic doctrine, believe they were born into this world having inherited Adam's original sin, so they know nothing in their theology of alien sins. But knowing what the Bible teaches, then we know that man reaches a stage of accountability, understanding right and wrong, becomes accountable for God for his actions, and then sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. That's something a man does either omitting what God says he must do or simply missing the mark, transgressing, committing sin by doing that which God prohibited him from doing. Now we can spend a lot of time on that where Ezekiel says, a soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now that couldn't be an inherited sin such as we inherit the color of our eyes for our parents. It's something you do that you're accountable for that is contrary or against the will of heaven. So people baptize, but most of them who believe in Christ do not believe that you must be baptized in order to obtain the remission or forgiveness of your sins. I think you will see that as we answer the question from the Bible as to how was Noah saved, what sin really is, and uh, what place baptism has in remitting those particular sins. So let's look with what's been introduced by Peter. And you've noticed that he refers by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the events of Noah's day. And incidentally, let me point out, 
that if Peter, an apostle of Christ, who accompanied with Christ, also having received the baptismal measure of power of the Holy Spirit, by which God uh, revealed the mind of Christ in the New Testament in words where we could understand it. If he acknowledges that there was a Noah, a flood, a ark, and all those things we read about in Genesis 6, then that once for all sets aside and destroys the idea that that was just some sort of mythological story. Because if uh, people want to say the New Testament is the New Testament of Christ and it's infallible, it's the will of Christ, they can't very well read this from an inspired apostle and then say that really wasn't what it was when Moses, by the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit, originally recorded the event in, Matthew, in uh, Genesis 6. Now, the question I want us to emphasize is how that uh, this is used, that is referenced in the New Testament by the Apostle to the Old Testament account of Noah and his salvation, how it figures in with teaching us who are Christians what we did in becoming Christians and in teaching others who would read this letter written to Christians as he explains what people did in becoming Christians, what they must also believe and from the heart do in order to become a Christian. So he says in verse 21, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. That seems rather forthright, clear, and plain. He says, now I'm not talking about a bath to clean the body, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Well, then what is it? It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Why would it be the answer of a good conscience toward God? Well, hold that question. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up with the other apostles and by the Holy Spirit delivered the first recorded gospel message, you'll remember that before he finished his sermon, but not before he proved that Christ was the Son of God, that those Jews who were gathered there to obey the law of Moses, and they're described as devout men, gathered from every nation under heaven, that they were pricked in their heart at the message of Peter, Acts 2.37, they had not believed that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God, but through the preaching of the truth of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, they were brought to believe in Jesus Christ as the anointed one, the Messiah, whom Peter in that sermon said, Ye have taken, and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. He also mentioned the Lord did not leave him dead, but God the Father raised him up from the dead. Now I say again, they uh, were persuaded of that so much so that they were pricked in their heart. Their conscience bothered them. It upset them. They recognized their lost condition. And they interrupt the sermon and cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers in Christ, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of, the Holy, uh, uh, remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he said, For the promise is unto you and your children and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, keep that in mind as introductory to answering the question, How was Noah saved? Well, first of all, when you see that he likens um, the flood and the ark and Noah and his family in the ark unto baptism, the like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, we need to pose the question, from what are we being saved? Well, it seems to me rather straightforward. That is obvious. But it's at the foundation of controversy. That is, people, for whatever reason, don't understand salvation. Well, let's back up to Genesis chapter 6. And let's look at the situation as it existed. That is, in the world of that day as it existed, and it's not a very pretty picture. Look in chapter 6, and we'll begin uh, reading in verse 4. Galatia, I'm rather, Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that uh, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only uh, 
evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, it's not a matter of a lot of sin in the world. It's not a matter of most people sinning. You don't find that here. The whole world was contemned for their mind was only on evil continually. Now, is there any time for them to put their mind anywhere else when you've got a statement made like that? So it shows you how terrible the world had become. If you go over to Romans chapter 1 and also Romans 3, especially Romans 3, 9 through 18, you will see Paul talking about how people left God, why they left God, and what happened to them, the kind of ungodliness that they got themselves into. Because in this world, if you choose not to serve God, He will let you do that. He will let you go right on as you please, as much as your power as a human being will allow you to do it. So it's rather obvious when you read Romans 3, why He says, for all that sin and come short of the glory of God. Now, from what do we need rescuing? We need rescuing from the guilt of sin. We need rescuing from the consequences of sin, which is separation from God. I wish all of us appreciated more and more what it is that sin does to us. I say again, as I've said many times, when you consider the place God's prepared for those who die guilty of their sins and to where they're going to go, that ought to be sufficient. A devil's hell forevermore where there's pain and anguish beyond our minds to ever comprehend. That's the justice of Almighty God and what He thinks the consequences of pun the punishment as consequences to one dying guilty of sin ought to be. It's just our problem is we don't appreciate the justice of God. We don't live in a world that encourages really obedience to law. We talk about our justice system and so forth. Well, why would there ever be a justice system if there's no justice? God is just, perfectly just, and all other law comes from He who is perfectly just. So the law that uh, we are violation of condemns us, and to just act justly, we deserve damnation. On the other hand, when you consider the mercy of God extending to us salvation, and how far God was willing to go to make a way of forgiveness possible, then that ought to amaze us also. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, Paul wrote in Romans 4. So we're able to see what all God's done for us. God so loved the world. Look at that. He gave. Look at the gift He gave. His own Son, who not only came, but came because He wanted to, divesting Himself of all the glories and majesties of heaven and taking upon Himself flesh or the nature of man. And thus, the moment he came into this world, he was so separated from honor and majesty and glory that just to be a human in a fleshly body, he gave up no telling what. We can't understand it. But then to undergo as a sinless person all that he underwent, tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, humbling himself even to the death on the cross and all that's involved in that, then when we see what all God's done for us to save us from sin, the place prepared where He's going to put the sinner who chooses to die guilty of sin, that ought to help us understand the heinousness of sin from God's perspective and that we should develop that same view of sin in our own lives first into the lives of everybody else. It's the only thing that separates from God. Nothing else does. Now, when you look at Genesis 6 and verse 8, right after the reading we had a moment ago, the Scripture says, But Noah, in contrast to the way everybody else was on the earth at that time, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God knowing all that's the object of knowledge, God knowing all things, God's omniscient, He knows the hearts of every person. He looks at Noah, and he's not like the rest of these people. And uh, he finds grace. Favor, that's what grace means. He finds favor with God. 
Grace means receiving favor. He received this favor, this, this mercy. He gained the gift that was not earned or owed. God did not owe this to him. God's not obligated to save anybody. God could have justly wiped away the entire world, including Noah and his family. But Noah received a gift from God because of his efforts to live contrary to the way everybody else was living. And that gift he received wasn't anything he merited or he earned or God paid him for work done. And if you look then over in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, you will see very quickly that we too, being that Ephesians written to the church in Ephesus to Christians, even as Peter wrote to Christians, that we too are saved by God's grace even as Noah was saved by God's grace. Look at uh, these verses from the second chapter of Ephesians. We'll read about seven of them, beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead, that is, separated, how? In trespasses and sins. Wherein, in those sins, in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. That is, what motivated you and held your interest was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Well, there's a lot there that implication brings out that would do well for us to learn, but we move on. Among whom also we all had our conversation or manner of life in time past, how? In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. That's all that interested us. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now the Calvinist says, see there, it's by their nature. They've inherited Adam's original sin. Nothing they did. And that's, no, nature's not used that like, like that here. Nature is used to mean after you have lived among people who practice this kind of rebellion and sin against God for so many years, then you just simply do it too. Don't you know that's one of the reasons that in destroying all the little folks and innocent folks in the flood and much later on having the Israelites destroy all the children and little ones when they took over the land of Canaan, what were those children going to grow up to be? Same as their folks because that's how they were developed and that's how they were brought up and that's the thing they saw and that's the training they received and that's the teaching they had. And that's what Paul is saying by inspiration about uh, these folks, the Ephesians and others of the world. It had gone on so long, uh, we would say, well, it's just the thing they do because that's where they're from. And that's exactly what he's saying right here. Now, but God who is rich, verse 4, in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened or made us alive. How? Well, he did it together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Well, isn't that exactly what's said about Noah? That he was saved by grace. Now, look further. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his favor, and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now you'll notice in Ephesians 1, 3, as he begins the book, that he declares, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame uh, before him in love. That's verse 4. Well, now he chose us by the gospel. No wonder he said the gospel must be preached to every creature. Mark 16, verse 15. Now where does he locate all these blessings, forgiveness of sins being one of them? Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And if you go over to Galatians 3 and verse 27, you'll see that the doorway into Christ, and it's the only doorway into Christ, is being baptized into Christ. Now, look with me over to the great Hall of Fame chapter on faith. And that is Hebrews chapter 11. And let's look at some things that are said there because the question that we're answering is um, how was it that Noah was saved? Now we've already seen that Noah was saved by grace, uh, Genesis 6, 8. And we've seen that we're saved by grace. Now that's interesting. Realizing that Paul said in the Roman epistle 
that these things in the Old Testament were written for our learning. Well, what do I learn from the inspired Moses account of Noah being saved? Well, I find out he found grace or favor in God's sight over and against what everybody else had found because their mind was only on evil continually. Well, when we go over to Hebrews 11 and verse 7, you'll see that it was, remember the scripture says, he found grace or favor in God's sight. Now verse 7 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, watch, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by, which, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Well, now, what am, I, what am I learning from that? Well, I find out that it's a salvation, that is, Noah's salvation, was a salvation by God's grace or favor, uh, but faith is involved here. Salvation by grace through faith. Well, lo and behold, if you read the letter to the Ephesians, you'll see in Ephesians 2 and verse 8 that it's the same thing concerning how Christ saves us today. So as I look at Noah in that far distant patriarchal age under a different law, it's still Noah finding favor and uh, favor that saved him through his faith. And thus, in the New Testament, he selected as an example when it comes to how we should be saved by grace through faith. Note it again, verse 7. By faith. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. If he did it by faith, and he did, then he received instructions from God. We'll go back over Genesis 6, and you'll see those instructions. And he was faithful to God to the saving of his house. And he's used then by the Holy Spirit as an example of faithfulness for us today. Now, going on with this, all the faith in the world would not have saved Noah if his confidence, his trust in God based upon his understanding of God's word had not spurred him to do as God directed him. The building, that's action on his part, the building of the ark led to salvation. Where did he get the idea that an ark would save him from the flood? Why, God delivered it in the gospel of his day. The gospel to save him from the flood. He had found favor. He had found grace in God's sight. But that didn't rule out his understanding of the truth of God and the obligations it laid upon him to exercise his faith to benefit from what God's favor had provided for him that he didn't deserve, could not merit. Now Noah was obedient to God, not partially, but he was completely obedient to those things God required of him in order to be saved from the flood. The same chapter, at the end of that chapter, in verse 22, same chapter where in earlier in verse 8, Moses had recorded that Noah found grace in God's sight, also says in verse 22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Well, the current and long time held view of salvation by grace is that there's no law involved and there's not a thing in the world to do in order to be saved. But it worked very well with Noah. And he selected as one of those as an example for us to follow under the authority of Christ and the gospel of Christ, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16, so that we'll understand how it is that God's grace through faith saves us today from our sins and we become Christians at that point. That's about as fundamental as it gets. So Noah was obedient to God, not partially, but completely. Our salvation also requires action on our part. Jesus dealt with that among the Jews in his earthly ministry. He said many times, you know, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You can look at a number of passages in Matthew 7, 21. Now also it's interesting to note in this same letter to the Hebrews, these were Jews who had converted to Christ. They were being tempted through persecution to leave the New Testament system or the gospel system and go back under the law. The Hebrews letter is designed to show them the futility of such a thing, of even thinking it. And uh, they would have known all about Noah. They would have understood that he found grace in God's sight, but that did not mean he didn't have to do what Noah, uh, God told Noah to do in the way God told Noah to do it and for the reason. 
And so it is, you see in Hebrews 5, as it speaks of the Christ on earth doing what we couldn't do, that we might be saved by him, for he died on our behalf, shed his blood for the midst of our sins, purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20 and 28. We find out then that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect or complete to do what all God in the flesh had to do to save us, we couldn't do for ourselves. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's exactly what Noah did. He found grace. He heard the commandments. Faith was created in him through the word of God. He showed his faith was living and active. It was obedient. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. And then you've got that same type of reasoning done uh, by another who had been a Jew. And that's James. In James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26. I remind you, he wrote this to Christians who evidently in uh, their living the Christian life weren't uh, continuing to be faithful. And he reminded them of what it is to be faithful as Noah and others were faithful. Notice what he says beginning in verse 14 of James chapter 2. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Well, just take that back over to Noah. What would it profit Noah if he had said, I know God said this, I believe the flood's coming, and I know what he said about building an ark. I believe him with all of my heart. But now if I build this ark, I'll be trying to show I'm trying to save myself. So I'm just not going to build this ark, and uh, God will save me because I have acknowledged such in my heart. So what do you think would happen to Noah? He would drown. That's just all there is to it. He would not have benefited from the grace of God, the favor of God that God extended to him that he didn't deserve. Because his faith had to be such that it was built upon the thus saith the Lord, Romans 10, 17, and for it to save him it had to be living and active, and thus he had to do what God told him to in the way God told him to do it for the reason God told him to do it. So the fact that Noah believed God did not lessen the gift that God offered him. It's just the way he received what God had done for him that he couldn't do for himself. And if you go back to Hebrews 11 again and look in verse 6, right in the middle of all these lists of people who heard the word of their day and on the basis of it acted upon what he told them, notice, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, do you think this is said uh, about people who were thinking they could merit their salvation and God owed them salvation and thus there's nothing to do in order to be saved from your sins? Or is it the way that your faith leads you to accept everything God's done for you that you couldn't do for yourself? Say, faith, just that is, saving faith cannot be separated from action. Now, we learn from Peter in 1 Peter 3 and verse 20 that Noah was saved by water, the very water that destroyed the wickedness from off the earth, being that he was in the ark, bore him up above that, and when the water went down, he was left in a pristine, pure world as far as sin is concerned. It's interesting how that works. Water destroyed the world, but it saved the obedient. It saved the faithful. Peter says that it's the same way we're saved. That's what we have, and that's what we ought to be thinking about. That's why it's here. That's the message of Peter, reminding Christians what happened when they obeyed the gospel. Would we not be foolish to turn that down? When that's exactly the Holy Spirit's guidance of Peter to record such a thing as Noah and how Noah was saved, while we missed the whole thing. So he says the like figure, like what happened in Noah's day, when he was saved from the flood by the water that destroyed the world. The like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Well, it's not in the water. He says it's not taking a bath to clean the body. Well, then what does he mean when he says, but the answer of a good conscience toward God? Well, people who have good consciences legitimately toward God are those who have from the heart complied with his terms. 
Consider what's said in a common verse to us all regarding the importance of Bible study in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And that's why you study. You don't study because the preacher urged it on you, because you have Bible classes. You study to be approved of God. The idea is, is be studious of God's Word. Be diligent in that because you want to please God. Notice what he says, the, uh, the uh, matter of studying. Why? So you won't have to stand to shame. Well, a shame before whom? A shame before God. Well, I wouldn't think that a person is legitimately ashamed before God has good conscience. It's the person that can stand before God unashamed that has the good conscience. Well, he says here that uh, it's the answer, that is baptism, of a good conscience toward God. It's not the only thing that's the answer of a good conscience toward God. But in becoming a Christian, it's the point that God says, Your sins and iniquities I remember no more. You see, belief in God's essential. You couldn't have no being saved if you hadn't believed God. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. The willingness to turn from a practiced life of sin, whatever it is. Oh, that's repentance, and we're commanded to repent, Acts 17.30. The willingness to stand up and confess the one who saves us. Don't you think Noah would stand up and say, I'm not going to drown in this coming flood. I am going to be saved by my God. Through the means whereby he selected to save me. And that is by an ark made out of gopher wood according to the dimensions and specifications God in his word laid down to him. And he didn't have to be ashamed before God because he studied it out and followed all that was authorized by God concerning the ark. But at what point was he actually saved from the old world? It's when the flood came in to destroy the old world. He was born up in the ark of safety and delivered to the other side in a world free from sin. Now that's a like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. My conscience clean and my conscience is saying feel good. Why? You have done what God said you ought to do in the way he said you ought to do it and for the reason he said you ought to do it. You can rest secure tonight and pillow your head in peaceful sleep for heaven's on your side and you're not opposed to him. So we're able to see then why so much is said in the New Testament about that. I say again, the water by its own power as water has nothing to do with salvation any more than when uh, Naaman was commanded in 2 Kings 5 to dip seven times in the Jordan River. And rising up from that seventh dipping, he, his flesh came to him as a little child. Was there power in the muddy waters of the Jordan River to do that? No. It was his manifesting faith in God to do it by demonstrating his faith in an action. And so James says, you show me your faith apart from your works. And guess what? Really, you can't do it. But I'll show you how my faith is by my works. What kind of works? obedience to God, demonstrating one's living, active faith in God's system of salvation. And that's exactly what Noah did, and that's what everybody that's ever become a Christian does. And nobody is a Christian unless they do it. It's just that simple. So just as water washed away the evil from the world, leading Noah and his family into a new world, then the blood of Christ that he shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. And he purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20, 28. Then to be contacted or to come in contact with the blood of Christ, we must be baptized into his death where he shed his blood. And the blood is the power. And that's why we sing the song, the power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Well, how do you contact the blood? You can't go back there and have the actual blood drip from Christ onto you standing beneath the cross. You can't go back there and go into the tomb with the dead body of the Christ. And when he rises on the third day, come out of the tomb with him. But you can obey a form of doctrine. And that's exactly what Paul said to Christians in Romans 6 that they did in becoming Christians. So, but God, be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Used to be, not anymore. 
when you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then, when's the then? When they obey the form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. 16 and 17 of Romans 6. And if you want to see what the form is, look in 3 and 4, and you will see that we're baptized into his death. There's a reason for that. It's because he shed his blood. And in our faithful compliance from the heart with the Lord's will, the grace of God that favors us, that has delivered the gospel to us, as we have faith in God and comply with its mandates, we receive the forgiveness of sins when our faith is so living and active that we're obedient to the truth of God. Just as Noah found grace in God's sight, heard the stipulations laid down by God in his word concerning what one must do to be saved from that flood. And in the end of it, it plainly says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God could, commanded him, so did he. You know, that's what we ought to yearn to be upon our own tombstones. David Brown, a Christian. And then think about Genesis 6.22. Thus did David, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That can be put on anybody's tombstones that are dying in the faith. And that's how you accept the favor of God you don't deserve and cannot merit. And that's the only way you can accept it. That's why you've got Hebrews 5 and verse 10 saying that we are saved by obedience. So we're saved the same way Noah was, not in the sense that we obey the same commandments, but our faith must be the same kind of faith as Noah's was. In order to enjoy the favor of God that we don't deserve, that has sent Christ to do for us what we never could do for ourselves as a perfect person, die on the cross of Calvary having suffered to the uttermost, the innocent for the guilty, and thus by faith in Him we are saved as we, of course, receive with meekness the engrafted Word, and thus the steps in the plan of salvation. You must hear the Word of God. You must, by that Word, have faith in Christ formed in you. You must be obedient in the sense of repenting of your sins, Acts 17 and 30. You must then confess your faith before men, Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32. And to become a Christian, you must complete your obedience by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Baptized into his death, wherein you're raised to walk in the newness of life. Therefore, you become a servant of Christ. More than that, he doesn't put upon man to become a Christian. Less than that, you'll never become a Christian. And that's the reason so many, mo at least most people today, who name the name of Christ so greatly with their lips are not even Christians. It'll be a terrible, I, I can't think of anything more terrible than for a person to live his life thinking Christ is his Savior and he's benefiting from the blessings of Christ, only to find out when he dies, you never became a Christian. That's terrible. And yet that's what most people are going to find themselves in. Those who all their life have read their Bibles. They've declared whatever denomination's message is of salvation. They've been sincere in their efforts. But they're as lost as lost could ever be lost. Because they have not from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine. And become servants of Christ. They haven't received with meekness the engrafted word not the totality of it that teaches the whole plan of salvation they haven't therefore benefited from the favor of God extended to man through Christ they haven't known the power of the gospel all because they were partially obedient remember what is said of Noah thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him so did he partial obedience won't get it whatever obligation is laid upon you to become a Christian, you must believe and obey all of those. That is, discharge your obligations. As a child of God, you're to live like the New Testament says you ought to live. There's obligations, in other words, to continue to show your living active faith as a child of God in the church. Now, that's how Noah was saved, and that's exactly how he is an example for us, although we're under a different law. We're under the law of Christ. Christ has all authority. And thus he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. So we ask you today to be saved in the way the Bible teaches. Receive the truth 
and become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Just a Christian like you read over in your own New Testament. That a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of those sins and God's second law of pardon. Confess those sins. We'll pray with you and for you. And if you're subject then to the marvelous invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>